and welcome to the National Oceanography Centre's Into the Blue podcast. I'm your host, Dr Zoe Jacobs. Today I'm joined by Professor Stephanie Henson to talk about the most exciting and important place you may never have heard of, the Twilight Zone. Welcome, Steph. Thanks for coming today. It's Thank good to you. see you. Um, so before we get into it, I wondered if you could tell us a bit about your career and the kind of things you've been working on at NOC. Yeah, so I'm in the Marine Biogeochemistry Group. And for those of you who don't know who, what marine biogeochemistry is, we study how biology and chemistry in the oceans interact. Mm-hmm. And I've been at NOC for about 12 years now, I think. Before that, I was working in the US in various different modelling groups, but always with an eye on the twilight zone, which is what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, so, I mean, the twilight zone to me sounds very mysterious and yeah. intriguing. <laughs> um, so what actually is it? It is kind of mysterious <laughs> and intriguing, actually. So it's the part of the ocean where very little light penetrates, so between right. about 100 and 1,000 metres depth. So it is pretty mysterious because it's dark down there, and it's really hard for us to observe. So mm. lots of weird things happen down there. Yeah, I can imagine. So um, what actually happens in this area of the ocean? Why do we care? What's important? Yeah, so it's important for three reasons, really. One is that it contains massive fish stocks, which are underexploited. So we don't really fish in that part of the ocean Mm -hmm. at the moment, but we know there's a lot of fish there. The second reason it's really important for carbon storage. So the ocean takes up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and the biology in the oceans reworks it, and some of it gets stored long term. And a lot of that action is happening in the twilight zone. And the third reason it's important is because every day the largest animal migration on Earth happens in the twilight zone. So billions of tons of fish and other organisms go down and back up every single day. We can't really uh, tell much about what's going on. We know it's happening, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's really, really hard to observe. So is that like a diurnal migration? Exactly, yeah. yeah so every yeah. single day they go up and down, yeah. Oh, cool. And so you're talking about the about carbon and things like that. So I've heard of this thing called the biological mm. carbon pump is that all to do with is that all to do with that yes yeah. basically yeah so um little plants phytoplankton yeah. that live in the surface of the ocean they take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and those little plants get eaten by little animals mm-hmm. um, in the in the top part of the ocean and those little animals poop like yeah. every animal does when it <laughs> eats um, and those poos are full of carbon and they start sinking into the twilight zone And as the particles are sinking down, they get eaten by other animals. They eat each other's poo. It's disgusting. (laughs) And all of that carbon is being reworked and recycled as it's sinking down through through the twilight zone. Now, that carbon is getting turned back into carbon dioxide. And it needs to get deep in the ocean to stop that carbon dioxide just going straight back into the atmosphere. We don't want that. We want it to be stored Mm -hmm. deep down in the ocean for thousands of years. And so um, we're really interested in understanding how deep the carbon gets, how long it stays down there for, all the processes and interactions between the organisms that's happening in the twilight zone. Because, yeah, there's a lot of um, making and eating of poo going on down there (laughs) that we'd like to know about to understand where the carbon is going. I was going to say, so actually... It's really important for the climate system. It's just poo, basically. So it's just, yeah, it's just poo, basically. <laughs> really um, but organic, <laughs> let's say organic carbon. That sounds a little <laughs> less <Yeah>. offensive, perhaps. <laughs> no, it makes it easy to understand exactly yeah. what's going on. Yeah. Um, that's cool. So what kind of marine life lives in the twilight zone? All sorts of things. Everything from the tiniest bacteria and viruses all the way up to whales. So okay. or everything you can imagine... Um, that's marine life mm-hmm. transits through the mesopelagic, we call it, that's a technical term, yeah. the twilight zone. <laughs> but again, we know there's bacteria, we know there's whales, we know there's everything in between. It's trying to figure out the interactions between those organisms yeah. is really hard. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, and actually, we shouldn't go into too much detail about marine life because I think our next podcast is going to be um, ah, great. Tammy Horton, do an expert on this one. So <laughs> yeah. that'll be interesting. So tune in to the next one if you're interested, everyone. Um, so the oceans are hard enough to study mm. as it is. Yeah. So vast, so much we don't know yeah. about them. Um, so I imagine in this region, it's even harder. I mean, we're talking about mm. deeper than 100 metres. So I imagine there's quite a lot we don't know about this region. Yeah, there's a lot. So satellites that observe the Earth's surface um, in lots of great ways can't access that zone because it's too deep in the ocean. Mm. And of course, the ocean, I mean, this sounds silly, but the ocean is huge. I mean, it's enormous, right? Not <laughs> only does it cover 70% of the Earth's surface, yeah. but it's really deep. And we're talking about that subsurface section. Can't see it by satellites. We can get there with a ship, 
but you know we're very limited in what we can do from a ship and we're only out there for a couple of weeks at a time yeah and we are now starting to use um, autonomous underwater vehicles to sample the zone but still the amount of information we're collecting really it's tiny compared to the size mm. of the twilight zone all around the world yeah so it's pretty tough to measure yeah no i can absolutely i can see that being yeah. a huge challenge um so does it matter that we don't know much? Well, I would say so, um, mm. because for the reasons I mentioned, you know, there is this big fish stocks there, which we don't know a lot about. Um, but also, w most of the work we do at NOC is actually centred around the carbon problem. Right. So we know that without the biological carbon pump doing its thing, atmospheric carbon dioxide levels would be about 50% higher than they already are. Oh, wow. So, it's, you know, that makes a massive difference. So we really need to understand how that carbon is moving around the system, where and when it's being stored, how long before it gets back into the atmosphere, um, and how the changes that we're making as humans to the planet through climate change, but also through fishing and so on, are affecting what's happening in the twilight zone and the store of carbon there. So we're doing a lot, lots of different ways that NOC is trying to address that problem. Yeah, that's so interesting. So, so if what we're studying is all the carbon, which is obviously incredibly important for climate change, um, could this be like an untapped resource where we could store carbon? Well, potentially people are starting to think about whether um, we need to somehow um, engineer the Earth system to help us store more carbon. Mm. We know that no matter how hard we try with emissions right now, we're going to blast past that yeah. two degree um, goal, which was part of the Paris Agreement. So although reducing emissions remains the priority, there's a recognition that we might have to do something else as well. And one of those something else is could be carbon dioxide removal in the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, several of the different methods that have been proposed actually involve stimulating that biological carbon pump to try and make it store more carbon in the ocean. Um, at the moment, the evidence is a little bit um, sketchy, let's say. We need to do a lot more research before yeah. we can understand what's happening. Like I said, it's all about the time scales of storage. You know, mm -hmm. you, you don't want to just make some new organic carbon, some new poos, and mm -hmm. then next year that carbon dioxide is back in the atmosphere. That's exactly. no good to us. It has to be stored long term. Yeah. And we also don't understand how um, perturbing the ecosystem of the twilight zone might have knock-on effects. Yeah. So I mentioned it could be an important food resource for humans in mm -hmm. the future because of the fish stocks there. If we start, you know, messing around mm. with those interactions between the different organisms, like what's going to happen long term? Yeah, and, and we don't know right now. So there's lots of research needs to be done to understand what's happening. Yeah. And if we start, you know, engineering these yeah. uh, CDR, these carbon dioxide removal approaches, yeah. we really need to understand that. No, definitely. I guess, I guess the interactions, as you say, are incredibly important. Mm. I mean, it's kind of when you think about fishing in general, mm. just in the upper ocean, if you kind of overfish in mm. one region, that really could affect other Absolutely. species. The whole kind of food web gets impacted. Yeah. So you've got to be really careful mm. how you're impacting all these things. Um, could it also be, so if there's lots of carbon kind of being stored or kind of the process of it being stored, could there also be a situation where carbon suddenly gets released accidentally or something... Something a bit like in the permafrost, they're talking mm. about these tipping points at mm. the moment about how suddenly a certain temperature gets reached and then all of a sudden all the carbon just floods back yeah. into the atmosphere. I mean, yep. could that happen with the oceans as well? Yeah, it could certainly happen with the oceans. In terms of the biological carbon pump, we, th we think that those extreme tipping points are probably not so likely because permafrost is one ecosystem, if you like, yeah. and there's a very clear threshold. Once yeah. it gets too warm, mm -hmm. it melts and that's those greenhouse gases are released. With the biological carbon pump, as I said, there's all these interactions and linkages there. And what we've seen so far is that the perturbations that we're making to that system through climate change are flexing it. Mm. You know, you can imagine all those sort of organisms down there and all the yeah. interactions between them. They're flexing it and it is changing a little mm -hmm. bit how much carbon is stored. But we haven't seen anything like a tipping point yet. Now, it's not, not to say that it couldn't happen with warming water, it's acidifying water, less oxygen in the water yeah. and so on. It's possible that it could happen, but we haven't reached that point yet, thankfully. Yeah. That, <laughs> that would be bad. <laughs> yeah, hopefully we don't for quite a long time. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, so what about the, what research does NOC do in the Twilight Zone? 
Yeah, so we do all sorts of things. Mm. Um, we've got sustained observatories like the Porcupine Abyssal Plain, which is in the northeast Atlantic. We've been going there for about 35 years and taking observations of both the organisms on the sea floor, mm -hmm. the carbon that's coming down to them. And recently, in the last sort of 20 years or so, we've also started looking at the upper ocean as well. So trying to link what's happening in terms of the carbon flows in the upper ocean yeah. and what's happening in the deep ocean. Yeah. So we've got those sustained observatories. That helps us understand time variability and climate change effects. Okay. We have also go out on ships. Um, we undertake expeditions to specific locations where we know something interesting is happening or to target specific processes that we think are important. And like I said, we're also now doing a lot of work with autonomous underwater vehicles as well. Mm. Um, that helps us to give more of a, a, a longer time span or a greater spatial area that we can cover with our observations, but we don't get the same detail as we do yeah. from, from ships. Um, so those two are quite complementary. And the final thing we do is a lot of modelling work. So trying okay. to improve how we represent the biological carbon pump mm. in models yeah. so that we can make better predictions of the future, how climate change will affect the pump and how that feeds back um, into our climate. Oh, cool. That sounds really interesting. So quite a lot of different activities Lots. going on. Lots of things going <laughs> yeah. on. Yeah. Um, and is it more expensive to work in this twilight zone compared to um, the upper ocean? Well... <laughs> yes, in a way, I suppose it is now you put it like that, because um, so satellite data, which I mentioned before, give us a really good overview of everything yeah. that's happening at the sea surface. I mean, they cost millions and billions of pounds, dollars, euros, whatever you're working in. Um, but once they're up there, they tend to give you data for 10 years or so, and they're sampling the oceans all the time, yeah. everywhere, all the time. So you get an incredible quantity of data. Mm. Whereas the twilight zone is buried under there. Mm. So you have to rely on ships or autonomous vehicles, um, which we know can be can be expensive. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> with the advent now of the global um, biogeochemical Argo program, which is just starting up, we're getting far better coverage. These are autonomous floats. We put them out in the ocean. They measure um, the particle concentration. They measure the phytoplankton that are there, temperature, oxygen, all sorts of things. Um, and that data all goes into an enormous database that anybody can access. Mm. And that kind of large scale database is really helping us to understand what's going on. And it spreads the cost across multiple nations. It's a real international effort, so yeah. it makes a difference. That's really good. I guess like, yeah. the international collaboration, I guess, is really important. It is really <laughs> important. Because yeah. the Twilight Zone is not just in one ocean. No, exactly. <laughs> it covers, you know, it's in every ocean. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and most of it is outside of national boundaries as oh, well. Right. So, um, you know, because it's 100 to 1,000 metres, that's off the continental shelf for most countries. So it's international waters, mm. which means we really do have to collaborate internationally. Yeah. So. An example of uh, that kind of international collaboration, I recently heard about the Jetson project, mm. which is being led by NOC, isn't it? It is, um, yes. I know that's kind of like a huge international thing. There's lots yeah. of different countries and people involved. Um, so can you tell me a bit more about that? Yeah, so Jetson stands for Joint Exploration of the Twilight Zone mm -hmm. Ocean Network. So very catchy, I'll just call it Jetson, it's a bit easier. <laughs> yeah. So Jetson is, a, like you say, it's a huge international project that NOC is coordinating. Mm. And the goal is to bring together researchers from around the world who are working on the biological carbon pump. And so the idea is that we can share data and we can share best practices, we can share what we've learnt, uh, we share our knowledge. Um, to try and get a better handle on what's going on down there in the twilight zone. Instead of, you know, a programme happening in the UK and one happening in the US and one in Australia, exactly, and we're, yeah. you know, we're not really talking to each other, we're not collaborating. This is the best way that we can to improve our knowledge, improve the amount of data we're collecting. So one of the important things we're doing, for example, is setting up um, data collection protocols. So saying, right, instead of us all measuring different things in slightly different ways, Let's make sure we're all measuring the same thing in exactly the same way. And then we're basically creating a huge database because it's all intercomparable. And so there's, there's little things like that, which just make life easier when you're faced with a data shortage. Oh, my so. gosh. Yeah. I mean, consistent data sounds really nice. <laughs> yeah, it's really important. Really important. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, so... Is this is this kind of program or project? Is this? I guess this is really important for kind of future climate change reports, like for the IPCC and things like that. Yes, yes. So we're, we're hoping to contribute towards future IPCC reports. Mm -hmm. I mean, the IPCC did highlight in the last report, which was published in August 2021, that um, there's 
high confidence, as they say it, um, that changes to the biological carbon pump will happen as a result of climate change. But there's really low confidence in what those changes will be. Right. And even what sign, you know, is um, the biological carbon pump going to increase in strength in response mm. to climate or decrease in strength? Even, even that we don't really understand. Yeah. So um, we hope that this Jetson project, bringing together all these different international efforts, will contribute to understanding a bit better what climate change is going to do in the twilight zone. Yeah, I imagine so. It sounds like an amazing kind of collaboration. So yeah, it's working really <laughs> well so far. Yeah, we've been doing yeah. lots of different activities, you know, as well as these sort of data yeah. sharing workshops. We've been having um, seminars online, you know, virtual seminars. Oh, great. And then making sure we do it in different time zones as well yeah. so people all over the world can collaborate. Yeah. We've been helping That's coordinate really multi-ship uh, missions. Uh -huh. In the North Atlantic last year, we had three ships all visiting the Porcupine Abyssal Plains site that I mentioned oh, right. earlier. Yeah. Um, and that was coordinated through NASA and the UK. So that is that kind of you know high level coordination is yeah. really, really important. And um, we hope to have the, the French colleagues have just got funded to come to the Porcupine Abyssal Plain Excellent. next year. So fingers crossed yeah. that will all work out. Sounds great. Are there any other regions that um, Jetson or any other projects focus on um, in addition to the Porcupine Abyssal Plain? Or is that kind yeah. of, I mean, it sounds like that's the main site of interest and it's ideal to have like a long... It's, yeah, it's one of them because yeah. we've had a long yeah. series of data there. We get all the sense. context yeah, of what's exactly. happening. Um, but there are also targeted areas in the Southern Ocean, yeah. which we expect to be particularly sensitive to climate change. That's yes. why we're studying that heavily. Mm. Um, but there's also lots of work going on in more regional areas. So where countries can easily access with their ships or with their autonomous vehicles. Yeah. So you get, tend to get a lot around the, the coastlines, yeah. at the, the US East and West Coast, Makes for sense. example. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the Europeans, are, we're doing a lot in the um, sort of subarctic, North Atlantic and um, edging up into the Arctic as well. So there's quite a lot of different areas. But I say it again, the ocean's huge. Mm. <laughs> and so these little areas where we're sampling, we, yeah. we get to understand those special areas really, really well. Yeah. But there's so much else going on that we just yeah. don't know about. Absolutely. You kind of have to target one region to, as you said, know it really well. Yeah. <laughs> and then hopefully just it will yeah. spread gradually. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, what we try to do is fill in some of the gaps with modelling work. Oh, yeah. So, course, so if good, we yeah. can, you know, if we can understand one region yeah. and understand all those linkages and interactions I was talking about, we yes. can build mathematical equations to describe what's going on. Yeah put it into a global model and mm -hmm. hopefully <laughs> you get something useful out of it. Although it doesn't always work like that, but that's the ultimate goal is to build yeah. better climate models. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Really kind of inspiring work going on there. Um, so in terms of like the wider picture, um, how does the work in Jetson and other projects in, on the Twilight Zone in general, how does that all contribute to the ocean decade? Yeah, so the ocean decade is all about um, you know, the science we want for the, the science we need for the ocean we want. <laughs> that's the right way around. Um, and so it's got goals like a healthy ocean, productive yeah. ocean, yeah. resilient ocean, etc. Um, and obviously, one of the aspects of that is, uh, first of all, understanding how the ocean will respond to climate change and how it will help mitigate the changes that we are making. So, you know, how will it take continue taking up carbon, for example? Yeah. And in terms of a productive ocean, obviously that relates back to this idea that there's huge fish stocks down there in the twilight zone that we, we don't, well, we don't use them at the moment. Um, so, you know, understanding whether it's a sensible thing to do to try and encourage fishing in that twilight zone or, or not, whether it would have unintended consequences that we don't mm. know about. So those are the kinds of themes that we're tapping into. And because Jetson's an international coordination effort, it's really in the spirit of the UN Ocean Decade, which is all about trying to bring together the work that's happening all around the world yeah. to deliver this, you know, productive ocean, yeah. safe ocean and so on. Exactly. So Jetson's just one component of that. But we're... Uh, we're, we're trying pretty hard to try push our agenda because mm -hmm. it's a part of the ocean, like you said right at the beginning, that most people just aren't aware of. No, so exactly. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't too aware of it before today. So yeah. I've, <laughs> I've learned quite a lot. That's good. Already. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and I guess like an, like an interdisciplinary approach is quite mm. important to address this kind of issue. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So we have people working across you know, physics, chemistry, biology, ecology, people from the observation side, people from yeah. the modeling side. We have all different people working on the problem, 
from different angles, mm. which is really important because, you know, if you just get stuck in doing it the same way that you've always been doing it, you don't know if you're ever going to learn anything. So this is where the advent of these autonomous vehicles has been really exciting because we're getting so much new information now yeah. that we just couldn't get before. So we're learning about how things change in the course of a few days to seasons, which we couldn't get before. We're learning about how things change over space as well, which we couldn't get before. Yeah. So, um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, this, this sort of international um, databases where people put their data, you can be confident that it's been collected in a way that's consistent. And it suddenly increases the amount of information you've got from just your, your little mm. patch yeah. to you know, the whole world, potentially. So it's that kind of international coordination which Jetson is really proud of. Yeah, no, that's really great. And finally, I just wondered if there was any way to kind of get the public more involved or just kind mm -hmm. of spread the knowledge about the Twilight yeah, Zone. Yeah, well, I mean, we have been doing what we can yeah. and <laughs> things like this. Um, exactly. And um, we also have done some outreach events. Um, we have a fabulous exhibit called, interactive exhibit called Plankton Poo Games. <laughs> if anyone comes to the Knock Open Day or wow. science festivals <laughs> in the region, you'll see the Plankton Poo Games where you're invited to make poos, not real poos. <laughs> it's okay. Um, and our colleagues at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in the US, for example, have been lighting up the UN building in mm. New York with displays about the Twilight Zone to try oh, wow. and educate passers-by into what the, what the Twilight amazing. Zone is. Yeah, it's really cool. So we're, we're trying our best. Yeah, <laughs> no, that sounds great. Um, so I guess, apart from Jetson, is there anything else on the, on the outlook, kind of future outlook for NOC? Yeah, I mean, NOC's got lots of projects around the biological carbon pump underway at the moment. We're getting heavily involved in the International Biogeochemical Argo Float Program. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, we recently bought eight floats, which uh, we've deployed in the North Atlantic, so that's very exciting. Great. That's the UK's beginning of the UK's contribution to that yeah. international program. And along with our colleagues in the Marine Autonomous Robotics Systems in the Mars Group here at NOC, we're thinking about ways that we can augment the platforms that we already have, like underwater gliders, to give us more information about what's happening down there in the twilight zone. So there's a, a ton of stuff happening. Yes. Um, like I say, our French colleagues have got some funding to come yeah. back to the Porcupine Abyssal Plain site next year with two ships. So hopefully we'll be able to catch up with them and uh, contribute as well to their program. So it's all it's all going in the it's right all direction. Going on. So I guess <laughs> it's all going if on. anyone's interested, watch this space. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been amazing to chat with you, Steph. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the Twilight Zone and the Jetson program, visit our website, knock.ac.uk, and head over to our Under the Surface pages. To ensure you don't miss out on new episodes of Into the Blue, make sure to subscribe on your favourite podcast app and follow the Knock across social media. See you again soon.